which is entitled uh, Mascot, Fast and Malicious Adv uh, Arithmetic Security Computation with Oblivious Transfer. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm presenting a joint work with Marcel Keller and Peter Skoll. In this work, we present Mascot. Mascot is an MPC protocol. I'm not going to repeat what an MPC protocol is. I'm just uh, going to say that uh, in this work, secure multi-party computation means exactly what we expect. So is secure function evaluation. Our problem is that we have a set of parties and they want to jointly compute a function, an arbitrary function f on their input while keeping those input private. Uh, of course, we want correctness, so if we have a result, we want that this result is correct, and we want privacy, informally meaning that the, party, the parties should learn essentially nothing but the output. When we consider a multi-party computation protocol, uh, we may have many different settings, um, and if we, proper, if we want properly describe an MPC task, uh, we need to specify, first of all, this, the functionality, uh, so what we want to achieve. Again, informally, we want to evaluate a function f represented as an arithmetic circuit. Uh, and then, of course, we, we need to uh, specify the, um, uh, the, sec uh, the security of the protocol um, and, uh, and the adversary, so what the adversary can do and how many parties can be corrupted. In our work, we consider uh, a static malicious adversary, so all the corruptions may only take place before the protocol starts, and the adversary can arbitrarily deviate from the protocol. And then we consider dishonest majority, so the adversary can corrupt all but one parties. Uh, it is well known that uh, uh, with dishonest majority, uh, it is uh, unconditionally secure protocol cannot exist, and we cannot guarantee uh, a successful termination of the protocol. Uh, so in our case, uh, the protocol simply abort if some, uh, if some um, corruption are detected. Uh, typically, the public key machinery, uh, sorry, yeah, typically the public key machinery um, needed to define an MPC protocol in this particular task is very expensive. And one possible solution is to define uh, our MPC protocol in the so-called preprocessing model. So we can assume a trusted dealer uh, which doesn't need to know uh, the function to be evaluated and the inputs of the protocol and uh, it just supplies all the correlated randomness uh, needed in the online evaluation, and then at this point, this online computation can be information theoretic. Uh, during, okay, so for, for, for now we assume uh, this trusted dealer, and all the online computation, uh, in the online computation, the circuit is evaluated gate by gate in a secret shared fashion. So to ensure privacy in the dishonest majority setting, um, uh, we can use an additive secret sharing scheme. So each value in the online computation uh, is secret shared in such a way that each party holds a share uh, with the constraint that the sum or all the share is equal to uh, the value. At this point, privacy is not more an issue because even a set of n minus one corrupted party cannot recover the value. Uh, and to ensure uh, correctness, again, one possible solution uh, is to use a message, a message authentication code. Okay, so we denote by uh, gamma uh, the MAC, and given a value X that is additive secret shared, a MAC on X uh, is given by this product, alpha times X, where alpha is the global key. This means that alpha, does, alpha doesn't depend on, on the value, but is fixed uh, in all the protocol. And both the MAC and the global key uh, alpha are additively secret shared, so are unknown to the parties. Okay, um, the choice of an additive secret sharing scheme uh, is of course the most natural when we consider dishonest majority. Uh, but it's also uh, convenient from a computational point of view because uh, it's linear, so all the linear gates are locally evaluated. For uh, multiplication gate, the situation is just a little bit more complicated, assuming that we denote with this box here uh, a value uh, x that is authenticated and uh, 
uh, secret shell, just we have seen before. Uh, and X and Y are the inputs of a multiplication gate. To evaluate this gate, we can use uh, Beaver Streak. Uh, so what, how it works, we need uh, a random authenticated triple from the preprocessing. And once we have this triple, uh, the parties open these two value, X plus A and Y plus B. And then they evaluate the multiplication gate uh, locally. So this is how the online uh, phase works. Uh, linear gates are local, multiplication gates are computed using Beaver Streak. And I want to say that uh, every time a value is open, the MAC on this uh, value is checked, and this can be done during the online computation or at the end uh, of, the, of the computation uh, in such a way that uh, the secret key alpha is never revealed, so it can be used for multiple evaluation. Okay, so the online phase is very uh, simple. Uh, it's clear that now the main challenge is to uh, implement the offline phase. During the offline phase, the parties generate uh, uh, the correlated randomness, uh, and after this, all the basic operations uh, are almost as cheap as um, those used in the passively secure protocol based on Samir, uh, Shamir secret sharing. So this kind of approach is uh, more flexible because uh, it allows um, uh, active security with dishonest majority, and it's also uh, convenient uh, uh, from uh, a computational point of view. Okay, and uh, yeah, I want to say that uh, uh, in the preprocessing phase, okay, the, the parties uh, create a correlated randomness, and here and only here they use public key uh, crypto. Okay, okay currently uh, there are two different approach uh, to, uh, to implement the offline phase. The first one is uh, the one used by Bedosa and Speeds, so it makes use of homomorphic, homomorphic encryption. All these protocols here require uh, expensive zero-knowledge proof to achieve active security. So the online phase is very efficient, but the offline phase uh, is not that efficient. Uh, it can be also uh, thousands of times uh, great, uh, yeah, slower than the online phase. So this for some application is not very practical. Uh, the other approach is the Tanyo T approach by the protocol Nielsen et al, and it makes use of oblivious transfer. These protocols don't require zero knowledge proof, but they achieve active security uh, with different techniques. The point is all these protocols only, works, um, only work uh, for Boolean circuits uh, or binary fields. So in this work, uh, we fill the gap and we propose, um, and we propose what? Um, a multi-party computation protocol for arithmetic circuit based on oblivious transfer for the first time with malicious security and uh, uh, with the dishonest majority setting. Yeah, uh, I want to say that all these protocols are very good, are practical, especially if compared with, uh, uh, with the FHE staff. The advantage with Mascot is that we, al we also have an efficient offline phase. Okay, uh, here in this, in this table, uh, we can see a comparison between Mascot in the last row and Speeds, because Speeds was the uh, best previous uh, MPC protocol for arithmetic circuit and with active security. Okay, in the last column, we have the number of triples, because this is what we want to generate in the offline phase, is the number of triples generated in the two-party case per second. And we compare mascot with speeds with active security and with speeds with covered security. And we can see uh, that uh, if we consider a prime field, then the number, uh, yeah, uh, mascot is about uh, 200 times faster than speeds with active security, and in this case, we also have a small improvement in terms of communication, and it's about 20 times faster than speeds with cover security. If we consider now the binary case, the improvements are even bigger because of the 
uh, somewhat homomorphic encryption scheme using speeds is not very well suited for binary fields. So in this, in this case, mascot is uh, about 1,000 of time uh, faster. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to describe how we achieve this result, uh, how we achieve active security, because I think this is the main uh, contribution. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll give you some detail about the implementation. Okay, so now we are going to implement the offline phase uh, using oblivion trust, oblivious uh, transfers. And uh, yeah, we want to produce random authenticated triples. We use OT and the uh, core idea. Yeah. The core idea of Uh, of our protocol is uh, an arithmetic view of oblivious transfers. I was firstly described by uh, Gilboa in 1999, but uh, only for the two-party case and with passive security. Uh, we have seen oblivious transfers in the last talk, but ju just very quickly, uh, yes, oblivious tra a standard one of two oblivious transfers is a two-party primitive uh, between a sender and a receiver. Uh, the sender inputs to bit string x0 and x1, and the receiver inputs a bit choice b. And the OT functionality outputs uh, xb to the receiver. It doesn't generate any output, any output for the sender. And the security guarantee is that uh, the sender should not be able to recover the bit choice b, and the receiver should not be able to recover the other string, x1 minus b. Uh, now we can rewrite the output uh, here xb uh, of, the, uh, of uh, this functionality in this way. Uh, clearly when b is equal to zero, this is x0, and when b is one, this is x1. We can re uh, rewrite this expression using the value a equal to x x1 minus x0, and we obtain okay, this. And this is equivalent to rewrite uh, the, the, the OT functionality by using x0 plus a instead of x1. So we are, uh, yeah, we, are we have now a correlated OT uh, where the uh, two uh, input strings are correlated by the value a. Everything works exactly in the same way when x0 and a are uh, a field element. And what are we doing here? We are uh, implemented uh, this product, B A, where B is a bit and A is a field element using uh, correlated OT. This is not what we want because we want arithmetic multiplication, but is a starting point. Okay, so what we want exactly, we want to implement this functionality, uh, we call uh, it oblivious product evaluation. Uh, this functionality takes as input A and B. Uh, that are, these are fields element. And we want to obtain uh, X uh, for Alice and Y for uh, Bob, such that X and Y are additive sharing of uh, AB. Okay, now trivially we can notice that B uh, is a finite field element, so B can be expressed using uh, is, uh, its bit representation, so that the product AB breaks down into uh, K uh, multiplication of this type, where BA, BI is a, is a bit and A is a field element. And this is perfect because we know how to do this using a correlated OT. So to implement this functionality, we just need to run k correlated OT, and in each of these, uh, Alice input a random value xi and her bit a. And Bob inputs uh, the bit representation of b. So for each of these uh, correlated OT, we are implementing one of these products. <coughs> Okay, after uh, this, uh, Alice and Bob locally compute X and Y, and trivially X and Y are additive sharing uh, of uh, AB. Okay, so uh, using this oblivious product evaluation, we can uh, uh, implement 
the authentication and the triple generation. Because uh, if we remember the authentication, to authenticate the value X, we just need to multiply X for the global key alpha. So uh, authentication and triple generation are very similar. We will see that they are not completely identical, uh, but clearly they can be, uh, can be implemented using the same primitive. Now the question is, is this uh, enough to get active security? Well, of course not, because if we look a little bit more uh, in details, uh, we notice that Alice has to input the same value A in all these uh, correlated OT. And of course, if Alice is corrupted, she can arbitrarily deviate from the protocol, um, and, uh, and we, we obtain an incorrect result. So, for example, if Alice uh, inputs um, an inconsistent value A plus delta A in the first correlated OT, then we obtain a result like this. Of course, this is not correct, but more importantly, this may leak information about the private value B. Because at the end, we check the correctness, and uh, this check may fail or not, depending on the secret bits B1. If the check fail, uh, passes, Alice knows that uh, B1 is equal to zero. So we have this selective failure attack, and we have to find a way to avoid it. Now it turns out that uh, uh, we need uh, two different approaches for authentication and the triple generation. So this is where the two are different. Uh, for authentication, it's enough to check uh, uh, the correctness of a random linear combination of max. And we show that this is uh, enough. Uh, first of all, this check doesn't leak any information about B. And then the intuition is that one, once uh, a random linear combination of values is opened and the check on this value is checked, then the parties are committed to these values and they cannot open to different values later in the protocol. And for example, if, uh, if uh, we know X and if we know a Mac on X, then if the adversary wants to open a different to a different values, then passing the, the, the MAC check would imply the knowledge of the global key alpha. Now, if we generalize this uh, uh, to the multi-party setting, uh, we can have different deviation. For example, the adversary can input inconsistent values with different parties. However, uh, this uh, will, will cause the MAC check to fail with uh, high probability. So this is something that uh, we consider in the security analysis, but, analysis, but it's not real uh, a, big dish, a big issue because we don't need to do uh, something else. Okay, now the situation for triple generation is different. We cannot check a random linear combination of triples. Um, and we have seen before that uh, if we check the correctness uh, of a triple just after, uh, yes, just after uh, the creation, we can see that the, with the, um, uh, and if we check the correctness with the standard sacrifice technique, uh, then this check uh, may leak information about the value B. So we need to do something different. What we do? Okay, we, um, we create a random triple using a simple variant of privacy amplification. And after this step, we check correctness. And the intuition is that at this point, the selective failure attack is somehow uh, mitigated so that even if we have inconsistent values, the check doesn't leak any private information. A little bit more in detail, uh, our triple generation protocol uh, starts by generating a vector of triples, a vector of triple uh, of this, of this uh, form, A, B, C, where A is a field element, and B and C are a vector in F to the M. So we have actually M, triple, M correlated triples, because the value A is, is the same. 
After this, uh, the parties sample a, a random vector R, and then they locally compute B and C uh, by computing these inner products. And again, the intuition is that uh, with these inner products, any leaking bits in the starting vector B are combined with non-leaking bits so that the final, res the final result is uh, uniformly random. So if the adversary wants to, uh, uh, wants to, to, to get some few bits of uh, this final value B, he has to guess many bits of the starting vector B. Uh, and in, an interesting observation here is that uh, uh, in our protocol, we need to remove leakage only on one component of the triple. Uh, while um, in, uh, in uh, previous work, we may have uh, leakage in all the components. So in this case, we have to repeat this, uh, this procedure uh, three times or using different techniques. However, this is not the case. And just to give uh, you some number, um, if the field F is big enough, so for example, 128 bits, M equals to three is enough to get uh, um, a statistical security of 64 bits. Okay, so now we know how to, to implement uh, uh, the offline phase and how to achieve active security. And the question is, uh, well, is this really efficient? Because, okay, in the two-party case, we just need to run uh, two correlated OT. Uh, in the multi-party case, we need to, uh, to, to, to run uh, a correlated OT per party, so maybe this is not really efficient, efficient uh, especially because uh, OT, uh, is well known, uh, is a public key uh, crypt or primitive. Uh, so, for example, if we use uh, uh, this protocol that is, most, is the most efficient protocol for uh, oblivion transfers, the protocol by Chu and Orlandi, we can generate uh, 10,000 of OT per second. So, if we want to evaluate, I don't know, a circuit uh, with 1 billion OT, of this, we need, uh, uh, I don't know, half an hour. So, this is not bad, but it's not uh, exactly what we want. To get real efficiency, uh, we can use OTS, OT extension. We have, see, we have seen uh, uh, OT extension in the previous work. Uh, yeah, we OT with OT extension, uh, we can generate uh, 8 million of OT per second. So again, if we want to uh, uh, evaluate a circuit uh, that requires uh, um, 1 billion of OTs, we just need a couple of minutes now. That uh, maybe is not ideal, but it's, big, it's a big improvement respect to uh, the half an, half an hour uh, of before. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, we have seen OT extension. Uh, how it works, very quickly. Uh, we start with few OTs that are real OTs, and just using cheap symmetric crypto, uh, PRGs and hash function, we can generate an unlimited number of OTs. Uh, I want to say that um, uh, after this setup phase, the extension can be repeated an unlimited number of, uh, of times. Okay. So we have uh, a software implementation that is uh, uh, publicly avail available. Uh, I don't know much about the implementation, uh, so if you want uh, the details, yeah, just ask to Peter or Marcel or look at the paper. Uh, we use this implementation to test the protocol uh, in a LAN environment uh, up to five parties. Uh, yeah, I, I have already uh, shown you that uh, uh, in the two-party case, we can generate up to 5,000 oh, triples, that is 200 uh, oh, time time uh, faster than, uh, than speeds. 
And using uh, uh, a single thread, we, we can generate 2,000 OVTs that is still uh, 72 uh, times better than the speeds. Okay, summing up, uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we describe an actively secure protocol for arithmetic circuit uh, based on oblivious transfer. The preprocessing uh, phase uh, is, uh, is uh, very efficient compared to previous work. And I, was, I want to say that uh, it's also interesting from uh, a theoretic point of view because after uh, a one-time setup phase that corresponds to the base OT, uh, now the preprocessing phase uh, is, uh, is, based, is based, uh only on symmetric uh, primitive. And also, it's based on simple assumption uh, because uh, OT can be based on, uh, on the, the, uh, the DDH uh, lattices, while uh, uh, the sum automorphic encryption scheme uh, is, based on, is based on the security of RLWE that is not uh, very well understood. And I would just to say that communication is the main uh, bottleneck, uh, so it will be very uh, very nice to, to improve uh, uh, our result in this, uh, in this sense. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, are any questions to this talk? Yes, please. Uh, could you compare uh, this work to the pr uh, work on multi-party active secure uh, uh, online, offline, so your computation for the binary case? Is it just that you've extended to arithmetic circuits or have you made other improvements that would apply to the binary circuit case? Uh, so can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, could Sorry. you please compare the, the diff what you did in this work, which is uh, for arithmetic circuits, to the similar work in a similar setting, multi-party active secure, but for binary circuits. Does anything that you've done apply to the binary circuit case? Uh, well, yes, of course, it can be applied to, to, to binary circuit. Uh, so we would have this protocol be better than the protocols that only apply to binary circuits? Uh, well, yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, any other questions so far? If that's not the case, then thank you again for your talk. And uh, before this session ends, um, Benny Pinkers wants